dry wet sort of thing you know this double disc opener now you can go through it it plants a uniform depth and it plants um, sand as well as heavy soil the same way all the people who I associate with around in where I live are good at what they do and we all feed off each other if we see that they're doing it better than us we quiz them about how they did it and why they did it and 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 that's the reason we move that practice onto our farms you guys have been able to you know, give me the confidence to be able to do something a little bit outside of the square. And, um, no, I'm sure there are plenty other opportunities for plenty other farmers around there to be able to utilise you guys to try and get that little thing that just makes their practice a little bit better, you know. Back in about the 1920s, the Maltese came to this area. I mean, a lot of Maltese came here just for the for the opportunity. My parents are born in Australia and eventually 74, 1974, they bought a farm in Havana. My brothers eventually took the farm over and they bought this farm here in, in Havana in 2015. We're working for the reef too. We're working for the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon, which is kind of the hole from out of, out of the reef into the inner reef. So it's very important. So up until the 80s, the farming in Lakai was all mechanical based. In the 80s, it changed to that green cane trace blanket and all chem chemical control of weeds. So chemicals nowadays to the growers are a fundamental part of their farming system. Our job really is to minimise that movement um, to protect the local waterways and ultimately the inner, inner reefs. The aim of this project has been, in terms of water quality, is to put numbers on farming practices. So our aim has been you know, to look at farming practices and their effect on water quality. And our trials are exactly the same. There's six row strips and we have six strips in a trial. Is we collect water out of the middle three rows of a strip. These three rows get funneled through this flume and, and once there's more than 10 mils of water going through the flume, we'll start taking samples. The sampler will take a hundred mil sample. And inside, inside here is a nine litre jar. And the sample gets dropped inside that nine litre jar. Uh, so throughout the rainfall event, it'll just keep taking samples and eventually fill up that jar. And when it's full, it'll stop. And we'll come along and take a subsample out of the sample. It's important to put numbers to farming practices rather than just assumptions. Let's get really good data and then put it through the science community, through the advisors. We as growers, we as the industry, do not want to have chemicals affecting the environment. And it's all part of our social license to operate, which is a part and parcel of all businesses these days. The importance of not damaging your, uh, your, your environment and the social people you live around. So uh, that, that's, from that alone, it's important to, to work on this. not six due to a uh, flight delay so you have a look in your programs there uh, Paul Brady he'll be towards the end smart farming futures has been unable to catch us because of a delayed flight so we've got five but speakers will be revolving between next door and in here so there's no need for anybody to move between now and afternoon tea if that's all right all right so we're going to get on with our first speaker uh, he is a generational farmer who has been successfully managing the challenging areas of his mixed cane growing and grazing operation. Now, he's been closely working with reef catchments and catchment solutions to address issues like invasive weeds and also fish barriers. Today, he's here to share his knowledge on managing natural areas of coastal properties. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please give a warm welcome to Jason Bradford. Trevor and uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's, uh, it's, I'm excited to uh, be, be part of this forum here today. I, I had heard about uh, Project 
catalysts in the past, but I didn't honestly know exactly what you guys did. And um, uh, perhaps I might have, might have been living under a rock a little bit, but um, it, it looks that um, <laughs> you guys are you're right up my alley. So um, exactly the sort of innovation and the, the new ideas that you guys portray, very interesting. So thanks for the opportunity to, um, to, to listen to my little, what I can contribute today. Guys, um, a little bit about myself, I guess. This little farm is um, about halfway between Mackay and Serena. Uh, it's about, about 20 k's from here. We bought it back uh, in, well, my grandfather bought it in the back in the late uh, 60s. And it's, it's about 300 acres. Um, it's a successional sort of thing. I own half of my brother bought the other half. So, you know, we had 600 acres there um, originally. Um, I guess... What happened was about five years ago, I, I bought this off them to allow them to retire, and and I sort of come up with some ideas regards what I wanted this to look like in the future. And the theme of um, this project Catalyst stuff, where it says finding the balance, farming, supporting nature, and leading revolutionary change. Well, I don't know about the revolutionary change so much, but I certainly am supporting nature. Um, so. I, I still work off farm um, uh, in, in a part-time capacity, so I work for BMA and um, I've, I've worked in various sort of management positions there. So I learned a little bit off that. I brought some of that thinking into the farm side of things, um, and nowadays I, I, uh, I do still work there. Um, I load the ships at the moment, and that, that does give me a lot of opportunity for research, so um, a lot of that ideas um, come from sitting on those 12-hour shifts. Um, Look, why did I want to do this? Why did I actually want to go in this direction where I could have just been conventional and keep the farm going as it was? I, I guess it comes back to the fact that I actually... Um, let's take this out of here. That I actually grew up on this farm and, and so there's a lot of memories there. It's almost a little kakadoo. And um, I wanted to, to make sure that under my stewardship that this, this place didn't, didn't go backwards, that in fact it did go forwards. And... Um, and I thought, well, how can I do that? So one of the ways was to have a look at some uh, use, use of technology and have a look back. And I could find uh, back to 1959, and this is the block in 1959. And what I was worried about, as you can see, this is actually Sandy Creek here. Um, Alligator Creek comes down here. They are our boundaries, so the, we, have, we have saltwater boundaries on two sides and the highway um, on the western boundary. So this is the block we're talking about in here. And to keep in context, the, some of the wetland stuff that we're doing is in this area here. So I, I looked at some of these, uh, these, these uh, salt pan areas and I asked myself, are those places uh, growing? Are they receding? Are they better? Are they worse? Is under our uh, management, are they going in the right direction? And the answer was generally, yeah, they're going okay. But um, there, was, there was some improvement to be done. So you can see that like we really are um, at the interface between <laughs> the, the reef and, and the agricultural areas. This is one of our paddocks. So by the way, it's a cane and cattle enterprise. Um, and uh, sort of that's just one of the paddocks and at a, at obviously at a high tide. So they are islands that you can see in the background. We, we really are on the edge. I think there's, there's four of the cattle paddocks that look like that. So we have to be conscious of... Um, what we're doing. It is a fragile little ecosystem. Um, what, what happened was I, I, um, I had a look at some of the opportunities that we might, we might be able to do. That's, that's another, another picture of one of the other paddocks. Um, this is a picture of a, of a wetlands area on the block and basically that's a man-made wetlands and what, what would happen there, there's a direct interface between um, that, that lagoon and the marine environment. And what would happen there in a dry year, um, uh, all, the, all the marine creatures that would get in there would, could suffer like 100% mortality because if, if that dried out at the wrong time, um, the, they wouldn't be able to complete their life cycle and get back in the, in the, in the creek. So the idea was for that particular lagoon to um, try and work with, with the nature. That lagoon is full of hymenacne. It's an introduced grass. It's a, it's a weed, it's a pest, um, except if you're a cattleman. So, so I, I call it a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a bearer's nightmare, but it's a cattleman's dream. 
So exactly, um, it's a ponded pasture, so exactly when you need feed in winter, that is a lush paddock. It looks like a paddock of forage sorghum and it, it, it gives you opportunity. So I wanted to keep the hymenacne, but I, I also wanted to keep and enhance the nature aspect of it. So um, that's a theme for the talk, I guess, in that what I've been striving for the whole time is win-win situations. Like, I, I want my cake and eat it too. I want the business to be um, stronger, better, more viable, but I also want the, the water quality outcomes the, and, and, the, and the nature outcomes to be in that same boat too. That's just a picture of the complex that we did some work on, uh, looking back towards the, the uh, Bruce Highway here, that's looking, looking west, and you can see the marine environment right here. Um, this is another, up the other end of the farm, um, and I guess I, we, we actually put a fishway in here too, so this little section you can see down the bottom is, a, is the salt pan coming in. Um, we made this little pool so the salt water flows actually straight into there on a big tide and there's a fishway that leads up into what essentially is a drain. So this, this drain sort of leads directly from our cane down here. It never had any of this stuff. It was simply a drain. So, um, so what happened was I, I had a bit of a vision of what I wanted to achieve here because I knew what could happen. Um, uh, this, this, this particular area was the spillway of this lagoon and, and um, I think my best throw at the cast net there was 127 barrow trying to get in. So I knew, I knew the sort of recruitment that was happening there and I wanted to be able to facilitate that, which I guess where reef catchments comes in as well because I had heard, a little bit like Project Catalyst, I had heard about reef catchments and um, didn't really know a lot about them. So I put together, I made a phone call and they said, look, we'll, we'd be interested in talking to you. And um, so I put together a little bit of a vision statement of what this might look like and uh, the rest is history. So they have helped me immensely and um, without them I wouldn't have been able to do any of this stuff like the, the financial viability is just not there. So what we did, we, we dug that channel. Uh, Hyman acne doesn't like to grow uh, in anything more than water about two metres deep. So the alternative to that is going into those sorts of environments and spraying it, whether it be a drone or a helicopter or a boat or whatever, um, spraying that, that high acne out to try and keep it under control. But how I keep it under control is through the use of cattle, strategically through the use of cattle. So that channel that we dug that, that links directly to this fishway is more than two metres deep. So naturally the high acne doesn't really want to grow there. And uh, so that keeps us open, that's good water quality outcomes. And it's, 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 it's a, um, again, it's a win-win because I'm not spraying it, I'm not, um, I'm not having to manage it, and I'm still getting the advantage of being able to use that hormone acne. So um, well, this is just some photos of, of the sampling um, that, that's been undertaken there. Like, I, I won't go into the detail with it, but it's amazing the amount of life that comes up there. And uh, we've just been, it's a, it's, a, it's a good outcome to have facilitated those sorts of thousands of fish a day, juvenile stage, coming into that lagoon, not affecting me. Um, I still have the financial outcomes. They get to do what they're supposed to do. Um, that's our first barra that we caught coming up there. And, and as part of this here, like um, we actually planted about 4,000 trees um, on, on the place too. So th those trees, that, that was last, actually last February. So... Um, those trees, some of those trees at the moment are like three metres high, so they've, they've enjoyed the experience. So basically, um, one thing I did forget to mention with that particular catchment is that it catches a lot of water, like there's, I think there's about 400 hectares of, of catchment that can flow into that and exit into the marine environment directly. So we're, we're trying to um, capture that water, use it, uh, we used to use it for irrigation, but, but we don't anymore. Um, but we're, we're trying to help it um, allow those fish to complete their life cycle. The other aspect of the, um, of the operation is a cattle one. And um, so we haven't talked, we talked a lot about cane here today, but um, on the cattle side of things, um, the big lesson 
that we, I think the whole place, the whole the 600 acres, we used to run it in three paddocks. And um, that has outcomes like a degraded pastures, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what I set about to do was to fence it, so to install infrastructure. Like a really, a really key part of this whole message has been that us humans have a hell of a lot of impact on an environment, and especially a fragile one like that. And, but we're blessed that we've got a brain, a good human brain, and we can manage that, that impact through the use of infrastructure. So in this case, um, gone from three paddocks to 20 paddocks, and what that allows me to do is, is to rest those, those pastures, um, really, uh, like, probably on average of about 60 days in between grazings, and um, the difference that it's made to the carrying capacity of the place, um, the quality of the pasture in, in 18 months has been quite amazing. Like, uh, probably, there's probably only 200 acres there of, of cattle country, and um, I'm carrying about 120 head on it. It's not, it's pretty marginal country, you know. Um, so, even, even down to the fences, we did some work on uh, fences and wildlife don't mix really well, and we have big, big, big numbers of wildlife there, birds and... So that fencing you're looking at there is electric fencing. That's a training paddock. So, so for weaners, um, they go in there, we, 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 we train them to the electric fence, which allows us to be out in the paddocks in the cells, in the grazing cells, single wire fences. So it's 32 inches high, very wildlife friendly, very economical, um, uh, easy, easy on the environment all around, and, and allows us to achieve our goals with the cattle. Um, that's just a photo I snapped down there <laughs> one afternoon, um, showing, showing the dry time. You can see it's brown in the background, but the, the cattle are there utilising the hymenacne, so they're taking care of the business. Um, again, more cattle orientated than anything else, but, but uh, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that a little bit of research, so there's, there's an app that you can get called Climate, I guess some of you guys would have, would have seen that and experienced that, and you, and you can ask it a question, you say, okay, in the Mackay district, um, I want to go back to, in this case, I think I said, I want to go back to 1990, I want to have a look at those rainfall patterns back to 1990, and I want to see when reliably we go green. So basically, green here, um, a brown season in between here. So that, that told me that around about the end of May in this district, it's a brown time of the season. It told me that, I think the question I asked of this was, tell me a time where we've had 25 mil of rain uh, for two weeks in succession at a 75% probability and hit enter. And for this district, it comes back about halfway through December. So, so I can now manage this enterprise uh, right I manage the, the, the grass reserves down in the cattle country. I know that uh, this is my dry season, so I can, I can work out the calving and, and I can manage down to a point where I'm rain ready here and um, hopefully the pasture's in the right state to start getting rain, start the whole cycle again. A really important part of all this work um, is monitoring it because you hear a lot of stories about uh, these waterways are uh, the, the lungs of the, of the place, et cetera, et cetera, and it's got to clean the water up. And I want to know whether it actually is going to do that. So let's look at some facts here. So this, this is a, an auto sampling station from JCU. Um, there's one of these on the outlet, uh, oh, sorry, on the inlet of the lagoon. It samples every four hours, takes a water sample. There's another one on the outlet, does the same. So it's looking for all the things that, that we as an industry are under pressure from. And uh, as well as that, there's actually some bores associated with that. JCU has put down four bores. There's a school of thought these days that the, the nutrients that we are um, discharging to the reef have actually leached through into the groundwater table, especially in these really shallow aquifers like here. And when they do that, if they do get into those underground aquifers, um, they're, they're directly linked to the, to the reef environment. So... There's, there's four bores there, they, they sample them continuously and, and uh, I don't know the results yet, they've just started and um, hopefully the results will be good but the point is that there's, there's no good guessing, we, just, we need to understand what's happening there and, uh, and if, if the results are bad, address it. <laughs> 
Um, the, the future, what does the future hold, I guess, for doing this sort of work? And a lot of people have, a lot of people ask me, Jason, why are you doing all this, all this work there? Like, you know, what's in it for you? And um, the answer is not a lot. There's not a lot in it for me, except for just the satisfaction, I guess, um, of, of knowing that you are leaving that in a, in a, in a better place. And, um, and, and hopefully, like, who knows what the future holds? You know, there, there's things like biodiversity credits that may come into play there. So all this, um, all this wasteland, um, what we considered wasteland in the past, uh, even salt pans and mangroves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, who knows? Maybe one day with the advent of carbon, blue carbon, there might be something in that. Um, I, th there's, we, we talked a fair bit today about soil health and. Uh, Really interestingly, the, um, the soil health benefits that I, that I see there is mostly in the grazing country. The cane is a really hard one, um, I have found, to, to work with because we've got this monoculture, back-to-back -back monoculture, and uh, there's not much diversity in that monoculture. Um, we, we've got, what we have got is we've got a plant that, that, that does a big heap of photosynthesis. It, it, it grows fast. It, it, it gives us a lot of biomass. So it gives us a lot of stuff, but it robs a lot of fertility as well. So in the cane, in the cane side of it, I can't, I can't walk there and say, look at the diversity that I've managed to implement into this landscape. I, I, I can't see birds and crocodiles and, you know, all those sorts of things. But, but I suspect that the, the answer in cane, and this is the gut feel, is that we do need diversity, but that diversity is probably going to be below the ground. It's probably going to be in the soil biology because if anyone um, has a few minutes one day, and it's probably better that you don't, don't let your neighbours see this, but lay down on a, on a blanket or something in your lawn and just have a look. Just lay down and just, just have a look at the, what's happening in front of you. Just in your, any old patch of lawn with the, the ants and the, you know, the little mealy bugs and God knows what else. So, there's diversity, right? It's like the Serengeti there, and it's even it's even more so under the soil. So, I got a funny feeling that that the answer for diversity in sugarcane lies in the soil, and not above ground. Um, how are we going for time there? So yeah, look, um, some lessons out of this. Uh, not everything is 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 based around like using your head and working at a dollar equation. I've tried to base everything to make that. Uh, financially just as good or better, um, but, but more in line with the hard side of things. And that's just seeing the nature and enhancing the nature on the place. Um, and I guess, you know, farming in an environment like that has its challenges. Like, and one thing's for sure, nature always wins. <laughs> it, it's, it's impossible to... You may, you may set it back, um, you know, but it always wins in the long term. Uh, for example, if I try and grow legume crops there, I try and grow, the, grow them in the dry time of the year. The dry time of the year is when all the, all the wildlife are coming back into the lagoons, etc. And um, you've got 10,000 geese descending on your soybean crop. It doesn't end well. And uh, you, you, you can't mitigate. <laughs> there's, there's, trust me, there's no way to mitigate that, you know. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so look... Um, it, I, I will continue to work with, with nature. I'll, I'll continue to, to demand a financial uh, performance from that. Um, if you're fighting against nature, I'll, I'll reiterate it again. It's like trying to win a, a swimming race with a bucket tied on your leg. No matter how much you thrash, you're not going to win that race. Um, I'll, I'll continue to work for ways to look even closer, to work even closer with nature. And, and I guess um, what this has done for me is it, uh, it's, it's given me the opportunity to to see some really meaningful results. And, um, yeah, look, I've become pretty passionate about it. And at the end of the day, there's a, there's a responsibility that comes uh, when just trying to manage things like that. And uh, basically, you know, I've got some skin in the game now and I need to, need to continue to go onwards and upwards with it. All right. Just wondering if there's any questions throughout the room. Question, Jason. You yeah. Mentioned you had your recovery time about sixty days on the paddocks. With the hymenacme in the wetter areas, do you lengthen that out and give it more of a spell, or is it similar type of recovery or grazing cycle there as well? It it actually regulates itself to a large extent. Um, the hymenacme can be a lot quicker. It, it's it's so robust, it's, it's ridiculous. What will happen with that, David, is that the cattle will, as the water dries back, they don't like walking out and standing up in their bellies eating. There's not enough bricks in it, I would suggest not sweet enough. As, as the country dries back, 
they, they follow it in and they eat it. So they regulate itself. But having said that, uh, you can run it at ridiculous rates. I run it at like uh, sort of three head to the, to the hectare and it, and it can do that for six months if you wanted to. Yeah. Another question for Jason at all from within the room? Yep. Again. Oh, hi, Jason. I was just wondering, with your lagoons, do you have any trouble with other water weeds like um, hyacinths or water lettuce or anything like that? Yeah, it's actually a very, very good question. So um, the whole, the whole precedent of this is that those weeds, I guess, are depending on uh, excess nutrients in the system, and I'm trying to harvest those nutrients, and in this case, turn it into beef. Um, uh, so to answer your question, yes, we do. Um, the, the wonderful part about that hibernate is I can harvest it with the cattle. I haven't worked out a way to harvest hi uh, hyacinths. However, however, that's an interesting point you bring up because along the vein of trying to, to utilise, turn up to work with nature, turn a problem into an opportunity, we did do some interesting trial work. Unfortunately, uh, financially, not real viable, but, but what we did is um, we, we, we had a long-reach excavator. We harvested the, the hyacinths. It, it, it did a beautiful job and it was, it was relatively quick. And we laid it in windrows on a fellow paddock of cane that I had. And, you know, anyone that's into compost knows that um, to compost properly you need to turn it. And you, need, you know, it takes a fair bit of management. Now, I didn't have the skills, nor the gear, nor the inclination to do that. So we, we simply laid that hyacinth, which is... Uh, in third world countries, a really valuable source of nutrient. You know, it's really valued. Um, so we laid it in, 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 in windrows on the fallow and, and amazing results. On a glue pot, a problem, a problem section of heavy soil, an amazing result. But I just can't work out how to afford the excavator and the trucks and you know, to, to do it on a sustainable basis. But it's food for thought. There's a, there's a resource there that's a problem that is turned into an asset and it's a, it definitely made a big difference. It's a real, that's another really interesting question. So the answer is yes. Um, but, but we, like, I need to touch wood here because uh, probably for about three years, haven't seen a pig there. The, the correlation um, was a shooting program in the headwaters of those creeks. Um, so Upper Alligator Creek um, and, and, and a little bit of Sandy as well, I think. And um, so I don't know what happened there, but, but they, that, the supply of pigs dried up. Now, uh, we're talking about biodiversity, one other thing happened that I neglected to tell you there. Like, uh, we told you that we'd been there 50 years or whatever, you know, and um, we'd never, ever seen a crocodile there, never, ever. And um, so that fish ladder went in, and within, within probably four months, um, the Reef Cashman's guys witnessed the poor old swan getting massacred at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and on the back of that... Uh, we thought we'd better go over and have a look uh, with a spotlight at night and um, lo and behold, we couldn't find that one, but we found another one. <laughs> so, 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 yes, look, we do, we do, have, um, we do have feral animals there. Uh, the, the, we have uh, lots of dogs there too, like lots of dingoes. And um, just really quickly there, like that, I think they travel down the creeks too. It comes to a point, they can't go any further. Um, so that's why I control mate the cattle now. So now I only have to worry about those... For three months in, in the year, like, and and I try and actually I try and allow a resident crew to be there. If there's only a couple there and they've staked out their home territory, well, most times I'll just leave them alone. It's the as soon as you take them out of the equation, it's all the, it's all the adolescents that come into it, and as adolescents do, they, they they play merry hell, you know. So trying to work with nature even down to that level. Ladies and gentlemen, we're out of time, unfortunately, but I'm sure uh, Jason will be around during the afternoon and dinner tonight as well. Uh, and Jason, just as a, a uh, thank you from us for presenting and sharing us your knowledge, please. We'd love you to accept that on our behalf. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank Jason Bradford. Thanks, mate. All righty, ladies and gentlemen, let's move on. Let's move on with musical presenters. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is passionate about soil health and innovation as well. Facing soil depletion in decades uh, of... Conventional farming, he successfully implemented changes that proved highly effective 
in improving yields and productivities. He's praised as a true innovator and was recently awarded for his improvements in tonnes and water quality as well. And he's also recently ventured into the culinary field, generating new income, if you don't mind, new income streams with this little beauty on sale just out at the registration desk, is that right? $10. $10 as well, so get on it. They're going quick. They are going quick. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, here to uh, share some of his experiences and his knowledge, would you please welcome Ray Zamora. Yeah, right. Have a go. No. It's, um, yeah, like he said, I'm Ray Zamora. Uh, I've been banging around this Catalyst show for a while. Um, yeah, it's good to be back at Catalyst to uh, catch up with all my mates. And I see a few new growers here too, which is good to see. They're all the uh, cream of the crop, as far as I can see. A little positive vibe in the room. And, yeah, gets everyone going. So... Hard to believe that it was only three years ago we were here and uh, Kim Clyden showed us her big gash. And uh, I'm happy to report that she showed me again last night and it's all healed up. <laughs> so it's, it's good to see. Um, so yeah, paddock to pallet um, and throw a bit of diversity in there I suppose. Uh, you know, I'm always looking for a bit of diversity on the farm as in uh, trying to get another income stream coming in because, you know, it's all right at the moment all our pockets are full, but we know there's tough times where the pockets are pretty empty. So I think it's a good time now while our pockets are full to look at something that can top it up when things are down in the industry. Um, yeah, this is just a bit of an example of uh, what I did the other year. Um, we had to go out some pumpkin seeds, me and the O'Tone boys up there at Billy Anna. We thought, oh yeah, this sounds good, it all adds up. Um, it was in the middle of COVID, so we didn't get a lot of help from the owners of the show in Victoria. And uh, they were, we were hoping to get uh, 500 kilos of seed per hectare. It's a total disaster, we got about 100 kilos of seed per hectare. So after... Uh, a lot of work and uh, a bit of, a little bit of money, not too much, but uh, yeah, it was a total disaster. We dried it in a drying plant, or we harvested it mechanically. They sent a machine up to harvest it, separates the seed from the pulp, and then we put it in this big dryer and dried it, put it in a one-ton bag for them to come and pick up, and that's the last we heard of them. We never got paid, so <laughs> not not even a phone call to say <laughs> anything. They just disappeared and uh, yeah so oh well, yeah you fail you go again did you <laughs> all right so uh, where's my next slide look like I've had this little sugar mill now for oh, quite a few years um, I just bought it for a bit of a hobby um, used to do the school fates with the kids and do the tally show and cane growers would get me in there to have little samples like Alan and Jenny were doing last night for all the tourists and even the locals. They never tasted it before. And uh, watching YouTube, of course, which I always do. Um, I see in America they were making cane syrup. And I was like, wow, that's pretty interesting. I could have a go at that. They just cook it in an open sort of vessel. And I thought, all right, I'll try some. Anyway, I'll cook some. I get, it tasted all right to me. I'm a bit of a sweet tooth. And I like food, as you can see. And uh, anyway, so, uh, yeah, shared it around a bit and everyone was, oh, yeah, this is really nice, yeah. And I'm just thinking, oh, are they being nice to me or what? I don't know. Anyway, so I decided to make some more. A uh, good friend of ours, um, David Morselli, most of you might have seen Dave or know him, ex-catalyst grower, retired. Um, he came up one Saturday and we made some. And I said, oh, yeah, she's nearly ready, Dave. Not quite. We need a bit more. Anyway, so we had a couple more beers. And uh, 
Yeah, we poured her out, poured it in some bottles. It looked bloody beautiful until we woke up the next morning and it turned into crystals because we, <laughs> we had two beers too many. <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, so that, yeah, the little mill there it only used to do 50 kilos an hour. It was really quite painful to, to use. So uh, I had to get the new mill. But this is, uh, I'm jumping forward a bit here. We uh, went to the food incubator last year. And it was the year before at Catalyst I had brought some syrup down for uh, Kim, just for a gift for her. Hey? Oh, she's in another room. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, I brought a gift down for her and uh, she really liked it. So I think that might have inspired her to get that food incubator idea happening last year and uh, yeah going to that joint there really opened my eyes up and I thought well I could probably bring some up and have a go at this and see what they reckoned and remembering what they told us uh, you know like if we don't think it's a good product or a good idea we'll just tell you straight so I was a bit nervous you know because <laughs> everyone tells me it's nice but is it really nice and do they think it'll sell and so I took some up there and they thought it was absolutely magnificent they couldn't believe that no one else makes it in Australia so I'm currently the largest producer of uh, sugarcane syrup in Australia. <laughs> Last year I made a total of uh, 130 litres of syrup. <laughs> anyway, so uh, after getting a bit more confidence after talking to the food incubator, I thought I've got to, uh, I've got to uh, have a go at this. So I had to get this new mill. Anyway, I had my eye on one on YouTube in Vietnam been watching this fella for a while and he's an American fella in Vietnam and I liked his product so anyway I had to talk to him on uh, WhatsApp I had to get WhatsApp on my phone to be able to talk to him and then uh, yep three horsepower three phase yep all right send it over air freight straight to Cairns so I had to make it first so it took you know, a while anyway then it arrives and uh, I just had to take it to the electrician to get it wired up and it's got a variable drive on it. And uh, the electrician's going, something's not adding up with these figures to me. It's, I don't think it's three phase, it's 15 amp. I said, no, nah, he assured me it's, you know, three phase. Anyway, so I rang the bloke. He goes, no, nah, no, nah, we tried it over here, we run it, it's three phase, hook it up. We hooked it up and it was like a lightning strike going off in the shed. <laughs> <laughs> so, another phone call. Um, yeah, and he sent over a new drive. He was very apologetic. Um, and uh, then we had to program this drive, which was another experience. Um, he was in the Philippines on holidays at the time, so we had a three-way hookup with him, my electrician, and his man in... Um, there were two of them in Vietnam. One was an interpreter for his electrician, and, oh, uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was comical. Um, <laughs> anyway, so we put the new drive on, and away she went... And uh, this, uh, oh yeah, this is my young fella. He's the, he likes doing a bit of this stuff. So, uh, yeah, hopefully, could get a bit of succession planning out of this too, this venture. Um, be good to see him come on the farm. Um, I think it's every, every farmer's wish that the kids follow him and take on a role. So it'll do uh, 700 kilos cane an hour and that equates to 500 litres of juice per hour. Which is yeah, pretty much yeah, bagasse by the time it comes out the other side. Alright so then I had to work out how I was going to evaporate it. Um, before I was just using a wok and then I got a bit of a stainless steel pan made up I used to put on the barbecue but it was really just a backyard show. So, on YouTube again. <laughs> I'm always on YouTube. But uh, so I, I looked at the maple sugar industry, cause, and it's, it's a massive industry in America, and uh, there's plenty of products there, out there to buy. So uh, I end up purchasing a maple syrup evaporator. It's a bit daunting, like uh, even buying the mill. I didn't know how I was going to pay for these. How do I buy something overseas? And anyway, you've got to go to the bank and you do a um, direct, a, a direct tra bank transfer. 
Anyway, when I did the, uh, the evaporator, I got a phone call that night from the fraud squad. <laughs> and uh, they were like, are you sure this is correct? You know, the, that's the right details? And I was like, yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure. And they said, oh, we think you should uh, make contact with them. So I'd, I had to try and ring them at midnight. And I had to YouTube it first to find out how to make an overseas call. <laughs> and me and technology don't get on that well. And anyway, I end up emailing them and I just asked the secretary there, was these figures, these numbers right? And she said, yeah, that's correct. Anyway, so then I had to ring the fraud squad back in the morning, give them the go ahead. And uh, anyway, yeah, then the evaporator arrived. So this is, uh, oh, that's not a very, should be a video here. Me a little set up here, put the juice in there. Oh, there's no volume, but I'll just talk. Just a couple of kegs, a little header tank there. It's got a, it's a continuous flow pan, so it goes into that float box, flows down the divider, back up, and it uh, comes out the side here. This is a, it's gas fired. It's very shiny, very expensive, and it's got an automatic draw off system, so I can set the temperature of what I want it to draw off at, and then it just opens the valve. Um, we have to continually. To degrees. make syrup, you've got to get seven degrees, seven degrees above the boiling point of water. But that changes on the day with the atmospheric pressure. So we have to continually uh, yeah, adjust that temperature to make sure it's drawing off at the right consistency. Um, yeah, it was pretty pretty easy to run that evaporator. I just set it up under the house. And of course it's got the exhaust pipe that goes out the back, so I thought I'll just stick it on a bit of an angle. It should be all good. And I forgot there's a PVC water pipe runs up above there and halfway through boiling one day there's water going everywhere. <laughs> so yeah, it's a few dramas, but uh, yeah, nothing. Quick trip to town and yeah, come back and fix her up. Um, this is a bit of testing gear. Um, the one on the right is the bricks of the, the juice. When, uh, when after it's squeezed, so that's coming in about 24. And to make uh, syrup, you've got to get it to 66 bricks. So um, the other machine on the other side, there's a hydrometer and it's got a temperature um, compensating gauge on it. So you just keep checking it and it, it does the adjustment for the temperature and when, you, when it floats at 66, that's syrup. So that's, uh, that's what me and David Morselli needed instead of having one or two beers more. <laughs> so this is my little bottling show that I use at home. It's a little uh, steam evaporator, it's like water jacketed with a um, gas underneath so the uh, only the steam hits the bottom of the thing and it, of the juice, of the syrup I should say, so it, you can't burn it. And then eventually I had to go up to the food incubator. Um, Mick was very good to work with and uh, Lara up there too, they couldn't be more helpful. Um, yeah, it's a bit... Uh, Bit daunting going in there. Go through the chlorine bath, put hair nets on, and <laughs> feel like you're going into surgery. So uh, it's a little bit of bottling going on here. I'll, be, I'll forget something to say anyway because I'm just flying blind here. I didn't take any notes for this presentation. Look at those little babies. Don't they look nice? Um, yeah, the bottling, everything went pretty well there. And, uh, yeah, then I had to get a label organised. I don't know nothing about labelling. This some. I just like cooking stuff, you know. <laughs> anyway... Uh, they put me in touch with a graphic designer and uh, yeah, they gave me a few ideas and done a quote up for me. I got this quote, I nearly fell over. So I got back onto Lara at the food incubator. I said, is this how much it normally costs? And she said, yep. I said, all right, well, if I'm going to do it, I better do it right. You know, like, no use taking any um, shortcuts. So there we have sugar rays, pure cane syrup. Um, yeah. So I'm hoping this venture is going to go better than the pumpkin seeds. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, I never knew there was so much um, stuff you had to put on a label and how you word this and that. And yeah, it's quite uh, a bit of a science to it. Even just getting the um, nutritional information, there was none in Australia, of course. So we had to get a label from America, and then the boys at DAF had to convert it over into Australian standards and measurements. And yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's about all I've got to say. Um, I'm sure Dennis will have some questions. Um. <laughs> all right, thank you. $10 only at the Reg desk, folks. Just saying, all right? Um, anyone with any questions? Right, eh? One quick one there, Ray. Uh, why wasn't it called Ray's Golden Drop? Because that was Dennis's idea, <laughs> not mine. <laughs> no. Um, it's a dual sort of question. Your first one was really is um, how did you go with... How quickly you got to handle the sugar syrup before it actually? Oh, sorry, the sugar juice before it will, will start going off because it supposedly does go off quite quick. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, oh, it was half a day or so, Willie. Yep. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. And the next one, how did you get through the loops of the food grade problems? You know what I mean? You're creating a food grade strain laws and all that. Stuff. Yeah, well, oh, that's why I went to the food incubator to bottle it because we get it. To, um, even when I bottle it at home, you get it to uh, 185 degrees and you bottle it at 185 degrees Fahrenheit. So in theory, which the Daft boys told me this is correct, you know, it's, it'll sterilise that bottle, putting it in that hot. But, um, yeah, you really do have to... I, if I'm going to bottle it myself, I really do have to set up a proper facility, yeah. Yeah. Ray, just um, different varieties of cane, different... Yeah, this stuff here was, uh, it's a bit darker, it's the Q200. Um, by the time we got going, it was the last, you know, two days of the season. I had no cane left, I had to steal some off the neighbours, I had to uh, get the harvester to leave a little bit behind, and uh, yeah, but the 200 makes a dark syrup, and the 208 seems to make a nice lighter coloured syrup, so I'll be, I think I'll aim for the 208, it's a nice big stick, easy to cut, yeah. Um, at Project Catalyst, <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, uh, it's just made for Project Catalyst. That's it. Nah, yeah. um, now nah, the food incubator will be helping me with the marketing. Um, they've warned me not to go to Coles and Woolies down that line. Um, I said I told them I don't really want to go to the markets on the weekend. She said, "Yep, that's a weekend killer." Um, but I said I would if I have to, you know, to get it started, and. Um, no, but into the boutique um, cafes and stuff like that. Yeah, they reckon that's where the really opportunity is. Hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. <laughs> there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Yep, just very quick, David. Sorry. What's the latest on that bit. I could make about eight liters of syrup an hour if I got it in full swing. Yeah. There we if, go. If, if I haven't got water hoses bursting above me and yeah, what not happening. Yeah. Yep. And like maple syrup, when they get out of the tree, is like 2% bricks. So whatever your bricks is, you divide that into 86, and that is your sap to syrup ratio. So I've got to do a lot less evaporating compared to them. Ladies and gentlemen, we're out of time, but I'll tell you what, Ray, fantastic presentation. Please accept our thanks. Everyone, Ray Zamora. Good on you, mate. Well done. $10 at the Rego desk, people. Going fast, going fast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our process of presenters keeps on going. Our next presenter over the last 15 years has been involved in 
complete, completely transforming his previous conventional methods of farming. With a strong desire to share his knowledge and experiences, he aims to discuss the advantages and the disadvantages that he's faced over time. He'll also talk about the outcomes of growing crops that cater to future markets. Ladies and gentlemen, here to discuss the journey from fallow cropping to harvesting hemp. Would you please welcome Gino Zatta. Um, are you, are you Zatta? Good afternoon, everyone. I'll just, um, that's the main topic. We'll get to that a bit later. Just a bit of a history of what, how we farm. I farm about 500 hectares in partnership with my brother. And we're on the southern side of Ingham, which is the drier, drier area. Uh, we've been doing fallow cropping for about you know, 15 years. And in the last four years, we've actually take, made it a call that it has to go to grain. We want to get some income off it. So we... Um, the soil health side of it from all the fallow cropping has definitely improved our cane yields. We've now gone to the next step into virtually zero tilling. We're direct drilling our cane straight into the stubble left over from the soybeans. So then we... I was actually approached by DAF to try something different in our cropping rotation because soybeans are only over the wet season. So would you like to try and grow some of this in season, which is virtually in that mid-year, the winter, winter rain age. So we teamed up with Ecofibre. They supplied us the seed. And we're off and going. Not that quick. Biosecurity first. Police check, bankruptcy check. So we needed a contract to grow. Three-year licence is 1500 bucks. We were lucky enough on our first year that Ecofibre carried us under their... Uh, trial licence and then we also had to pay to get it sampled to um, make sure it had less than 1% THC otherwise it had to be destroyed there and then so we we come on the 13th of June we were a bit late in 2022 to plant this crop for the simple reason that was our wettest year in, in the Herbert and we really would like to have got it in probably early June. So we were a little bit late. So there's a planning window. A couple of HCPSL staff. We've got Megan and Bethany here today who's helped me greatly with um, the agronomy side under Brock's control. I suppose all of you know Brock. So we plant three rows on the mound. That's, what's that, uh, two weeks later. That's how quick it grows. So this is the actual planning date. Just a, uh, they're just checking to see depth is correct. We're just pre-working. Um, there was a soybean crop prior to that, so it's just getting one rotary hoe pass to make a nice fine seed bed. So we planted at 15 kilos to the hectare, um, 30 mil deep, and the target it was nine seeds every 30 centimetres, roughly about 400,000 plants to the hectare but because we had gone to a three row to a mound those spacings actually got a little bit wider still end up with the 400,000 but we just had a, a bit bigger gap between the between the thing so a bit of this data comes from the Burdekin guys they had it the year before us as you would have seen that first photo is actually Miles's uh, crop of hemp so one of the important things was actually uh, soil tilt it had to be really well seed contact because it's a very small seed and it, it really needs that quick get up and go. Nutrition, we had to plant with 100 kilos a hectare of N, 70 of phosphorus and 110 of potassium. So it is, it's costing us money straight away from up at the start. Um, we did run out of fertiliser on the last couple of rows it doesn't grow without fertiliser, I can assure you. I can assure you that. Um, we did do a, a, a boron and zinc additive at a later date. That's on the 20th of July. We had a, a heavy soil patch in the middle there, as you can see, the poor germination. 
um, heavier soils, the two ends. Where we were doing all that seed count, where the, uh, Megan and Bethany were, was right up the top end in that, up there near the railway bridge, the better soils at that end. That's the same crop a month later. So that, that area did pick up and catch up with the, with the rest of them. Only issue we had with that is come harvest time, that was a little bit greener than what the, the rest of the crop was. So we did have more head of issues in that section because the crop was, cause your crop was green. So there's a, uh, all the time photos. We had one particular spot we kept taking the photos from that one spot. Just happened to be the worst spot right at the start here. And that's just on, just getting ready for harvest there on 8th of September. So getting to the harvest, we had to, we had a verdict uh, for the grass control and then we did a bromicide to get rid of some broad leaves. Same thing, we missed the row spraying just to see if there is a, a difference in the, in the bromicide. The bromicide sets the crop way back, but it does catch back up again because that one row that didn't get sprayed looked healthy. In the end, the other ones caught up and it had, they had no broad, no broad leaves whereas that one row was infested with it. Insects. We only did one spraying of Anticor, which cleaned up Healy's and, and these nice little friendly little bugs over there. Irrigation was three... Three irrigations, we did get 70 mil in crop, in crop rain. It likes, it likes water regularly, but not, not wet feet. And that was the issue we had with that little patch in the middle of the paddock, as it being a heavier soil, tended to stay damp. And then we harvested on the 26th of September. Now there's no desiccation with this, so you're critical on when you are harvesting, as far as uh, the seeds, the rule is that you tap the plant, if the seeds start falling off, it's ready for harvest. So you've, actually got a, you've only got a small window there of, of when to harvest. And it's a very slow process to harvest. It, um, there's a bit of wrap. I've seen the, some of the footage there on Steve's this morning. He had wrappage around his, his header here in Mackay. So that's the, one of the things. And, and once it wraps, it takes a bit to, to get... Um, cleaned up. So out of our crop we end up growing a tonne of hectare but that's some of the figures that the Burdekin were getting 1.47 tonne to the hectare, the worst in the Burdekin was a 0.7. Um, we end up with a tonne, that was the going rate of the pay, I, I won't hide, that's what we made, less expenses. Our only issue with that was that we had to bring the seed to Biloela to get dried. Um, since then, there's, there's a place up on the tablelands that was doing, can do the actual drying and, and um, grading. So there we've got pros and cons. It's a fa fast winter option, 120 days. Can you use the same machinery? Uh, grows fast, shades out weeds, and that was why we went to the three rows, and we do our sawyers the same way, three rows over a 1.8 metre bed to try and get as much um, shading out of the weeds. The residual end left behind was, um, we had taken some out because of the seed, but there was the cane crop after it looks really nice. Short harvesting window. What we did find benefit out of it. We didn't put soybeans back in that cane, into that so uh, we were supposed to put cane in, we couldn't we ran out of time. It was end of, it was in October and the way 22 was with the, the big wet season that we had, we didn't, weren't going to risk putting a cane crop in. So we put soybeans in and we noticed that we didn't use any insecticide sprays in the soybeans. So is there some residual or something that's left behind by the hemp that's helped us? The con side of it, yes, you need to be licensed. Um, Bill Wheel is a little bit too far away. We have got another crowd that's looking at venturing in, and that's um, Wandara, which may open up a facility in Townsville. So if that comes on, then, then it would make more incentive for us to get to do it.
And then I actually went to Western Australia to see my daughter. And I run into this guy at Margaret River. And he's got the plant to process it. He's an actual builder. And he processes it, builds houses, and he's into the thing. So out of the product itself, he was getting the fibre, which he was sending to India to make the textiles and that out of. Building pro uh, he's, he's the curds used for the building products, the seed. And then he was also doing this um, compressed stuff, which is actually a fire brick to put in your webbers and, and that sort of stuff. He was, if I hung, hung around another three days, I would, he would actually showed me the process of that. It was on another building. But he's got a full set up there, a decorticator, a trommel, screening plants, and, and he gets his five products out of there. And the way it's booming over there in, in WA, that he said, this, we're going to outgrow this little setup. I said, well, good, send it to the coast, on the east coast, and we might be able to utilise it. So the, the plant itself's got plenty of potential. It's just that we're not, we're sort of a little bit behind. We've just got to wait till we can get a bit more investment in the area. Um, and as far as suiting a cane rotation, it has to be an 18 month fallow to plant it in May. So, what we found is we can do a soyuz over the wet, hemp through the winter, back to soyuz for the next wet and then back to cane the following year. So we've got the trial going now. We're, just, we're going to harvest it this year to see if the benefit of, of all that comes through. And if, if it's So far, the cane's looking good, so we'll see once we cut it to get some extra tonnes. Any questions? Yep. Did you have any regrowth after harvesting, do you know? Oh, yeah, definitely. We, had, uh, we just harvested it. By the time I had driven to Bilawila to deliver it, because the issue was you grow it, you got to deliver it. So I come back, and we had picked up about, I think it was 20 mil of rain. It was like a carpet. So there's a lot of losses in the header. And our question was, what do we do with it? And so we, we let it grow to about 300 high, and we just off, offset the paddock to destroy it. Because if we wait too long, then we can't even get rid of it ourselves to... To, we were even having troubles with the offset binding up. So yeah, it was. Uh, but with one one disking, it was gone. There, there was no no regrowth again the second time. Second, or even uh, seeds that were, might have been buried in the dirt a bit. So. Yep. What about the moisture from bamboo to King Arroy or that? Mate, it makes moisture. We harvested it at thirteen percent. By the time I got down to Bilawila, and that was, we finished harvesting, I think it was about 4.30 or 5 that day. I jumped in the truck at midnight. I got to Bilawila at 1 o'clock, and it gained 5%. We were at 18%. So you need a drying facility within a couple of hours of where you're harvesting. Admittedly, I didn't have a silo to put on air. I do have now. That will pull it down a little bit, but the transport side of it, you'd be surprised how much moisture it does pick up. the volunteers between soys and and hemp or no? Oh yeah, Roundup will do the Re job. Yeah, but in, yeah. in crop, nothing in crop, they're both, you can't use anything in crop to that will kill one and not the other? Well, you can use shield and sprays, but the thing is, we harvested that crop in s September. I wasn't planting soys until December, so there's a too long a period, so we thought we'd just give it a working. Maybe we might just spray it out, but then with the soys, we need to put them back up on a bed, whereas that was growing on the flat. So. Sorry, Mark? But we use Valor as a planting residual with soys, and the bird can, would that take out these little... Yeah, I I'll, I'll use Valor everywhere else, but um, there hasn't been a trial actually tried to see if that works, even if at a lesser rate, because in the soyas we're using 200 grams to the hectare. You know, even if we did a small... I do, in my cow peas, I use um, 50 grams of Valor and I, I get residual control over the broadleafs, but in the hemp it wasn't... Yeah, so a few more trials. This uh, Last year we actually did another crop 
to harvest at our fallow cane early in, in, in the beginning of June, got the crop in in July, waste of time. It was, it's a, it's a winter crop, so you need to plant that, plant that early, so you need an 18 month fallow for it to actually work. You know, like um, you harvest your seed and then maybe roll it and take the, the rest of it, what's coming out of the header at the back? Yeah, the, we don't have anything to process. And this Wandara, That's Dave... That's one in Western Australia you're talking about. No, no, right? Western Australia is their own little thing. Uh, Wandara is here in Townsville and they're looking at... The problem is with Wandara, they don't have a breeding program, whereas Ecofibers have got the seed. If the two could talk together... We're laughing because they've got the seed and, and Wandara's got the processing facilities. Well, we'll have the processing facilities. So after the crop, how was your heavy soils texture? Is it, is it got a big taproot, the, that hemp? Was it texture? Oh, was it good to work up for? Well, it, we don't, is the, the soybeans do the texture for the soil. So, um, but as far as the soil health, for back the cane, it's, it's all it's breaking that monoculture, and we're doing three, three crops out of it, three cash crops out of that same piece of fallow land. Got time for one more question? I'll just bring the mic over, mate, just for uh, the streaming audience, etc. Thanks, mate. Yeah, Gino, just the, uh, interested in how you like you you take the seed off uh, with the header, obviously. You take it straight out of the header into a into a, some sort of a tip truck, do you? Or how do you had you transport it down? It's a fine seed. It must have had a pretty good setup to cart it from there to Biloela. No, it's just in our normal we've got truck and dog, but all our tailgates are sealed. Oh, okay. Yeah, so oh yeah, no, no, if you got a little hole, it'll Yeah, yeah. It'll spread it. <laughs> I won't be popular with the biosecurity. <laughs> I'll bet you wouldn't be popular. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are running short of time. I'm sure, Gina, you're going to get peppered with a few more questions during the day and tonight as well. But um, I'm sure you'll agree, a fantastic presentation again. Gino, please accept our thanks, mate, for all of your sharing of knowledge there. Fantastic. Gino Sato, everyone. Good on you, mate. Yeah,